text data is prone to the curse of dimensionality. We have high dimensional data and that does cause subtle and a uh, lot of problems. So we need to be careful. It means that a lot of our intuition from low dimensional space about distance in particular tends to be wrong. So something that may sound like a good idea at first sight may turn out to be not very feasible when you try to do it in real high dimensional data. And the name refers to a whole set of problems. Many of them are related. That's why it makes sense to give them the same name. And they come from different disciplines. People have observed it in one context or another context. And it turns out that it is somewhat the same problem reoccurring again and again. And the basic form is the, what is called the combinatorial explosion. If I have a lot of variables and I want to systematically try out different values for them, I get an exponential number of combinations. So um, I cannot afford to try all of this. The case that is widely known in the context of distance function is called the distance concentration effect. And that theoretical result has some weaknesses once you try to um, look at the well, effect it has on your actual data problem. And of course, it also means that we may have irrelevant attributes and we may have distorting attributes. And that kind of relates to, let's say, for example, the stop word problem. The stop words are words that do not convey much signal about the contents of the documents, but they have a high magnitude, so they tend to affect the distance computations a lot. So these are kind of um, related. But there's also been the observation that we, don't need, we should step out of the thinking of our traditional mathematical vector spaces. Just because we have a vector space that is R to the power of D, and D may be 100,000, does not mean that our data behaves like data sampled from a 100,000 dimensional data distribution. Because in text data, for example, our data is sparse. So a lot of these values will be zero. So if you want to understand how the data behaves, we probably don't need to look at all of these 100,000 dimensions, but there is some subset of dimensions that is relevant. We just don't know it beforehand. And we don't want to perform feature selection. But in general, our data tends to not behave like the number of dimensions that we have on paper because there's these zeros in there. But our actual dimensionality that describes the behavior of the data is much less. Nevertheless, it can be on the hundreds. And the effect that we have a lower behavior, lower dimensional behavior, is um, known as the intrinsic dimensionality. And that is also what is kind of behind when you sometimes now read the term the blessing of dimensionality in the context of neural networks. That if you have a lot of the attributes made, you may have redundancy in there, and your neural network may learn better because of that redundancy. Well, the redundancy means there's a lower intrinsic dimensionality. And neural networks, in particular the deep ones that we use these days, they are built on the assumption and on the idea usually that there is some lower dimensional space that describes the problem. And then we have some projections, nonlinear projections, that produce the data that we observe. So they assume there's a lower intrinsic dimensionality. And so these things all relate to each other, and um, we will briefly discuss them here also. Combinatorial explosion is the one that's definitely easiest to understand and to grasp. If you have a one-dimensional data space and we want to make buckets, we want to make 10 buckets in this one dimension, or in this case I made three buckets, then I get three buckets respectively 10 buckets. Easy. 
if I have a two-dimensional data space and I might make 10 buckets in each dimension, I get 100 buckets. That is still something I can probably manage on my computer. But once I have 10 dimensions and I want to make 10 buckets in each dimension, I have 10 to the power of 10 such buckets. But I probably don't have 10 to the power of 10 data points. And even if I have, they won't be uniformly distributed. So in most of these cells, there won't be any data. And if I'm considering the case of hyperparameter tuning, so I have 10 parameters in my model, the number of layers, the number of um, parameters per layer, and just 10 combinations in each of them, I end up having too many experiments to run. So I cannot try all parameters. So these things reoccur in very different um, contexts. And item sets, I cannot uh, try to enumerate all item sets of length 10 in frequent item set mining. All of these tend to just grow too fast. So I will need to perform some heuristic to reduce my search space, such as eliminating features trying to um, first work in subspaces and all of this. Now, text data, well, I can start with the more interesting words, for example, and try to focus on the rare words. And that does help with search. And that is done by the search engines. Now, this, the second effect that plays a role here is what is called the distance concentration effect. And it was like kind of formalized and proven by Bayer that in certain preconditions, data sampled from one distribution that has the property that as I increase dimensionality, the variance of my vectors compared to the expected value goes to zero, which is actually true for a lot of synthetic data generation processors. So the, con the precondition is not that crucial and they then observed that the difference between the maximum and the minimum compared to the minimum goes to zero. That is kind of how it was um, written. You can imagine that this kind of means the minimum goes towards the maximum, except that the scale changes. So we can also write d max divided by d min goes to one. And it's easier to see that these two mean the same. Because again, just pull out minus one to the right hand side as plus one. So the ratio of my largest distance to my smallest distance becomes one. So the largest and the smallest kind of no longer differ. That is asymptotic behavior. If I have infinitely many dimensions, which I don't have in reality. Nevertheless, this problem describes a lot of issues that we have in real data analysis. The precondition is kind of irrelevant for any practical application because it assumes my data is IID in all my dimensions. But if it's just random data in every dimension, I don't need all these dimensions. It's just random. So once I put in more than one cluster in my data set, this tends to flip to the opposite. I get a lot of separation if all my attributes are IID except for the cluster attribute. That kind of gives two different processes. But uh, still, this causes problems. It means I can no longer identify what is the central document in my cluster that tends to be affected by random deviations in the documents, not by the document being particularly representative. So, but it's some other property that causes one document to be more central than the others. And for practical applications, even if we have multiple processes that help us separated data, it may mean our numerical problems arise because we have so many attributes. 
it may mean that it becomes difficult to choose these thresholds. Because if the max converges to the min and the ratio goes to 1, it means I have a very small tolerance between choosing the optimum parameter, a parameter that is way too large, and a parameter that is way too small. Because I need to be between the minimum and the maximum with my threshold to, to define what is close and what is far away. So these, these problems continue to exist even if the prerequisites of this formal proof do not hold. For example, similarity search. That where we have algorithms that tend to help a lot in low dimensional data to find similar documents. The same algorithms tend to break down if I give them high dimensional data. Even if the data is not uniformly distributed. And then we often observe worst case performance of the indexes. There are some observations that ranks can remain more informative. So whether two objects are the closest or the second closest or the third closest, that still tells me whether they might be more related than others, even if the difference in their distance is tiny, or relatively tiny. We did some air experiments on this. And to get the required preconditions, we sample data from a normal distribution. We look at a normalized distance. It's normalized by an expected value. Think of it as the length of uh, the diagonal in a unit cube, for example. And then we can look at the, the distances of points in the distributions that we sampled from. You can do this with a uniform distribution. You can do this with a normal distribution. It really doesn't matter. So here, I think that it's normalized kind of to the um, standard deviation. And then I observe if I have one dimensional data, I have my mean somewhere here, one point something, and I have a certain interval where my, most of my data lies. And then I have a smallest distance of two points that is close to zero. So I almost sampled the same point twice. And I have a distance that is almost 7 as the largest sample from a single uniform distribution. I don't really know the exact number of samples, probably a million or 100,000 or something like that. You can probably try to estimate my sample size given this value, the maximum that I observed. But I can look it up. And then we increase dimensionality two dimensions, three, four, five, and so on. And as we sample from more dimensions, you can see that these distances become more similar. Until when, if I'm sampling from 10,000 dimensions, they are all pretty close to the estimated expected value. And that's kind of interesting, because remember that we are looking at Gaussians. So we have this Gaussian blob. And now pick any two points from here, and they have almost the same distance. That kind of means our data doesn't actually look like a ball anymore. It kind of looks more like a high-dimensional shell. They kind of seem to concentrate on what is called the margin, the data in the margins. I can do the same experiment, and instead of measuring the pairwise distance of two points, I can also just take the length of the random vector. So I'm sampling data from normal distribution, and I'm looking at the length of the vector. And of course, in one dimension, that should be one one standard deviation. But once I go to 100 dimensional data, it's, well, the expected value is still on, on my, depending on my standard deviation, but all the values have a similar length. So all my points suddenly lie on somewhere on this hypersurface. 
I no longer insight my data. There is no point close to the origin of my data generation process, despite this being the mode, the most likely point to sample. That's why the, these effects matter, even, even if I'm modeling the data with the Gaussian, for example. And I mentioned already the data tends to lie in the margins. And we can, again, try to model this and kind of prove that this um, observation is not just, well, um, intuition or whatever, but it is provable if I'm looking at very simple processes. So I'm using one-dimensional data, and I'm looking at the smallest 10% and the largest 10% of values. And then that's what I call the margin for now. And that means 20% of my data is in this margin. And 80% of my data is normal, is in the core. Now, if I go from one dimension to two dimensions, so I have 10% here, and I have 10% here, and 10%, of course, at the bottom, and 10% at the right that I cut off. I no longer just cut off 20%, but I actually already cut off more than one third of my data. And the core only has 64% remaining. And as I do this in more and more dimensions, at 20 dimensions, only 1% of my data is in here. And 99% of my data is out there. So can I expect any data to be in the middle? Not in all attributes at the same time. It will be outside somewhere. Or looking at anomalies. If we had a Gaussian distribution, it would be very common to make a cutoff at three standard deviations. And they point out there, if I have a normal distribution, they are considered to be outliers. So someone that is unusually tall, someone that's unusually small, has unusually large feet, whatever. That we know that um, for if the data is normal distributed, 99.74% of the data will be within three standard deviations. But what if I look at more than one dimension at a time? For two dimensions, it's still 99.5, 99.2. But once I'm at 20 attributes, I already have 5% of data that is anomalous in at least one dimension. And if I go to 100 dimensions, I almost have one fourth of data points that is a three sigma outlier in at least one of the attributes. So these effects kind of sum up, and that is still low dimensional for what we will be looking at. Mm -hmm. But uh, why can't we just fix the area we want to have in the middle instead of fixing the border? I can do this, of course. And does yes. that solve the problem? Well, by definition, it does solve the problem. But it doesn't uh, help me a lot, because then there's, I can kind of get to the, the other a problem that I'm missing all kind of extreme values because I'm only considering those points that are extremely rare outliers in all my attributes. And then, of course, it becomes rare enough eventually. I mean, this is a three sigma is already a pretty um, tough case because we are looking at, well, 2.6% of um, 0.26% of my data points per dimension, and I do get a problem. So I would probably need to go at least one order of magnitude. Yeah. So that is kind of a way, I can do this mathematically and make this more extreme. That kind of relates to von Ferrori correction if I do multiple testing. 
But that, on the other hand, means I, I have little chance of finding anything. So it doesn't completely solve the problem if we just play the numbers game. And this has kind of weird effects also. If you look at the size of a sphere and the size of a box. And we are now looking at a box that goes from zero to, uh, from minus one to one. You could fix it arbitrarily but that is pretty the easiest to, to see, and the same sized box. If we look at this uh, this way, we can see that my box is definitely larger. It completely contains my sphere. If I go to three dimensions, I still have like zero, minus one, plus one, and so on. It turns out that this becomes much more extreme, that I have much larger square, much larger box than my sphere, and my sphere only touches the box in these single points. And I have pretty large um, um, parts only in my box, which means approximating a box with, with a sphere gets difficult. Now I can try to do the opposite. I can make the, the sphere circumscribe kind of my, um, my rectangle. In, on one dimension, that would have be, um, that'd make a difference. So I'm using the value for two dimensions. And uh, so I'm using a radius of square root of two for the circle. And now in two dimensions, my circle is larger than my rectangle. It completely contains the rectangle. But in three dimensions, it doesn't. It now suffices to just reach the middle point of each of my edge, but not the corners. So there's already some part of my box poking out of my sphere. And if I would go to more dimensions, it would become worse. And if I had been using the um, circum circle for one dimension, we had the example in the previous case. So the size of a circle, or of a sphere, and of a box, they grow at a different rate. And I have this equation. You don't need to memorize that equation. You can, could always look it up if you needed it, but it's just an mind experiment that we're doing in here. That's the equation that you get for a hypersphere. And it contains a factor, r to the power of n, that of course would correspond to a box of length r in n dimensions. And we all, but we also have these other terms in here with that gamma function. And that kind of has two interesting competing effects. So if I'm looking at r equals one, so the, the box, the unit box, the example that we just kind of had, and I'm increasing the dimensionality, I get this middle line in here, and around five dimensions, I kind of peak, and I get a smaller volume afterwards. Kind of my, my, my ball shrinks if I look at the volume. It contains less data than before. And I can try to uh, counter this by choosing a la larger ball, but that kind of only postpones the problem. So instead of peaking at five, it now peaks at seven. If I would uh, take a ball of radius two, it would uh, peak even later, but eventually it will disappear because of these missing edges, the missing corners. So all my data then eventually ends up being like kind of in the corners of these boxes. That is the intuition that arises from this. Mm -hmm. The data is uh, at the uh, corner of the boxes or at the uh, uh, perimeter or uh, the edge of the cube? Well, we are in a hyperspace, so we have a lot of corners. But of course, there are like the, the lower dimensional types of, of edges and 
that, that do all matter. So if you look at this one, it's not just the data in the corner itself, but I also get an increasing amount of data in these parts. And if I would go to more dimension, it gets worse. As seen here, if I have the smaller ball, uh, it only touches here. So, but that means there is an entire area um, of data, kind of, um, how to best sketch it. If I would look at the subcube, I have quite some area here that I can move around back and forth and uh, get some volume. So it's not just in the corner itself, but in all the outer parts that are not, in, not of this ball of length one. And if I look at this in, on a log scale, going to 100 dimensions, I can see that I'm at a pretty small value of the data that is still in the unit sphere in 100 dimensions. Data from the unit cube that is also in the unit sphere. That's kind of the ratio that we are looking at at this point. And that has effects on type of, of all types of algorithms. For example, we have search algorithms. We want to find the nearest neighbors of some point. And the problem is we don't know the search radius beforehand. And if you do a range search, the range parameter is given by the user. But what if the user does not know the optimum search ra radius for what he needs? So this is the optimum that we want to, to find. And then we get maybe 20 results on this data set. If we chose a too small radius, we would be down here and we would maybe be missing five of our results, but we still found 15. That is okay. If we had chosen a slightly larger radius, we may have looked at some 26, 20, maybe 30 objects. That means we have wasted search effort. We have loaded data, we have computed distances for data points that we didn't need because we only needed 20. But that is just a certain cost overhead that we may need to pay for search. That is the behavior in low dimensional spaces. But we've seen in high dimensional spaces, the distances tend to concentrate. So they are all similar. Now, if my, this is still my optimum search radius, and this is still the reduced one that I chose instead, I certainly lost all my results. Because this difference in search radius made much more of a difference on my outcome. And similarly, if I chose my radius too large, well, I do find everything that I needed. But I processed a lot more data, so I'm a lot slower. I no longer have some overhead of 20% to guessing the right objects magically, but I suddenly have a multiple of the search effort. So search becomes slow if I overestimate the radius. And unfortunately, in high-dimensional data, getting this radius right becomes hard. And pruning data, stopping early because I'm sure that I won't have further results, tends to happen later. So I get, have to collect more results to eventually get the, the correct answer. So search in high-dimensional uh, data is affected by this, even if my data is not uh, random data that has the proven uh, properties of Bayer's curse of dimensionality, even if it's real data, multimodal, coming from different distributions with clusters and all of that, this effect is very real. So in summary, usually at some 10 to 50 dimensions, we start seeing this type of problem. It can be earlier if we do in grid type of enumeration. It can be later if we have intrinsic dimensionality. Text data tends to have more than 10,000 dimensions. 
And even with intrinsic dimensionality, the behavior is usually that of several hundred dimensions. Dimensionally, dimensionality reduction may seem as like an easy way out. It turns out it isn't, because dimensionality reduction, such as PCA, has the same problem. So you kind of just push the problem to the dimensionality reduction step to find a reduction that has the nice properties, and that doesn't work either. In, for quite some time, you always find, found in literature the claim, or if you look at Stack Overflow, that if you have high dimensional data, you should be using cosine dimensionality because cosine dimensionality is better for high dimensional data. No, it isn't. You can prove that cosine dimensionality equals Euclidean distance on d minus one dimension. So at most, you save one dimension. So um, that doesn't help. But it's like folklore that is found all over the internet and doesn't die out. The part that is more interesting is what I would call the signal to noise ratio. If I have 100,000 dimensions and every dimension helps me solve the problem, then I can pick a random subset and it, I will solve the problem. Look at 10 dimensions, I have a difference of 10, I have solved it. So if I have this signal, then it's easy. The problem is if I have dimensions that have some error, and these errors add up. I may eventually have more error than signal, and then I do have the problem. And to put this in the context of cosine, well, in cosine, we are looking at the dot product. So it's x, y times y, i. And it's a sum of this. And that is the, the, the big problem. We have the sum in here. Now, imagine every of these terms has some error. Because our TF IDF vector is only an approximation to the meaning of the data. And you may add a word or remove a word from the document and it stays the same. So there is some tolerance to these values. And all of these errors, they're multiplied together and they add up. And if you have too many of these tiny errors, then we do get problems in differentiating objects. OK, questions on the curse of dimensionality. So we looked at it from mostly from a theoretical point of view, but if you actually try to build search indexes, for example, it occurs very rarely. <laughs> 